Hi, my name is Dave Taylor, and I'm going to talk about this maple tree. This tree, if you've been on walks with me before, you'll probably remember it. It's our over 400 year old maple. So this is 2020. That would put it probably growing around 1600. And what a history this tree has. If we look at this tree, we can tell a lot about the environment and we can make some assumptions about what went on in this area. Imagine the year 1600. Europeans had only been here in North America for a little over 100 years. The French were exploring the area. This was the land of the Huron tribes disputed with the Iroquois tribes. There's a lot of history here. This area was not really populated very much because it was a disputed area. So this maple tree was planted at a time when to the north lived the Hurons and to the south lived the Iroquois. And the Iroquois lived on the other side of Lake Ontario. They would paddle across, make war with the Hurons, and then the Hurons would paddle across and make war with the Iroquois. And there were also other Iroquois tribes on either side, and the Iroquois from New York State would also make war against them. So there was a lot of conflict. So this area became a no man's land. And into this no man's land, this tree began life as a seedling. The wildlife that was here was similar, but not quite the same. This was a period in 1600 when we were in the Little Ice Age. The temperature was much cooler. Winters were longer. There were no moose here, but the big deer would be elk. And we know that an elk was butchered not very far from this very location. Elk were the largest mammals in this area. They lived here, but there were also white-tailed deer. This maple would have had to contend with both the elk and the white-tailed deer browsing on it. There were black bear in the area. But there were some animals that you think of in Mississauga. You see them on a regular basis, but they weren't here back then. The cottontail rabbit had been here but disappeared about 300 years ago before this tree was born and wouldn't return until the 1880s when this tree was almost 300 years old. That's because of the Little Ice Age, a cooling that happened primarily in eastern North America. The other animal you wouldn't find here was the coyote or the brush wolf. In fact, it was about the time this tree came into existence that brush wolves were actually being created in northern Ontario by a breeding between coyotes from the prairies and gray wolves. At least that's the current theory. And that took place about 600 years ago. But they would not arrive in this area. There were wolves and they would be the Algonquin wolf that we know today. But there are no wolves here and no coyotes then. So, the environment had changed. The forests were different too. This was a colder climate. The trees that we think that belonged to the Carolinian forest had died off. There were still some around, but they weren't reproducing. They would exist in little islands of forest, primarily along the coast of Lake Erie. So, the forest was changing and this tree started to grow. It would see the coming of the French. The French used the credit, they called it Le Credit River, Le Credit River, and they would go up and down it and they would trade at the council ring, which was at the mouth of the Credit River, where Saddington Park is. The French used this river as a conduit to go further north to meet up with the Hurons. The Hurons were the allies, the Iroquois were the allies of the British, and the French and the British back in those days were constantly at war with each other. In fact, they both engaged their tribes in warfare. So this no man's land went on. There were people visiting primarily to get the salmon. And this tree would have benefited from the salmon runs, which were Atlantic salmon, because the animals and the people would carry the salmon into the forest to consume them. Some of the DNA from those salmon, the nutrients from those salmon would get into the forest and it would help our trees grow bigger. We know this from work that's done in British Columbia on the salmon runs spectacular to think of the connections. Then around the early mid 1600s, 
the Iroquois came across in mass and they wiped out basically the Hurons. And this became no man's land again. And here this tree is growing and there's no indigenous people at all. But there was a tribe, the Chippewa tribe, a branch of which would move down about a oh, hundred years later into this area. We know them as the Mississaugans and they would give this area its common name. They would live here, they would fish here. And at that time, the Hurons and the Iroquois were both pretty much reduced in number and were no longer a factor. But it was the English who came in, especially after the War of Independence of the States. A lot of loyalists would move into this area and begin to farm it. And it was in the early 1800s that this area would be partitioned off and become farmland. So now the tree is living in an area where the forests are being cleared. Why wasn't it cleared? Who knows? You look around the forest today, it's mostly second growth forest. So most of what we see today is young forest, it's not 400 years old. For some reason, they let this tree stand. And so it stands to this day. Now it is an old tree. It has seen the growth of Mississauga. It has seen two world wars. It has seen the War of 1812, where they came in and they cut down the pine trees within a mile of either side of the Credit River, or 1.6 kilometers, to speak Canadian. It survived. This magnificent tree survived all of that. And it continues to survive. Its greatest threat now is modern people. We walk along the ground, we trample it down, and we're killing the fungus that needs, sorry, we're killing the fungus that lives in the forest, underneath in the soil. And these forests rely on those fungus, those tiny little filaments. And those filaments, when they're destroyed, can cause the tree to die off. And if you look at the top of the tree, you can see that it is indeed dying off. Now, 400 years old is about the maximum age for these trees anyhow. We've done some things to help protect this tree. We mulch the trail, we put in a boardwalk, we'll have to remulch the trail, all of that to keep from compacting the soil. There's no doubt that this tree is at the end of its life. But even now, it provides homes for pileated woodpeckers. Raccoons live here. Probably possums live here. Uh, deer browse on its many offspring. And you just look around this area, it's filled with young maple trees, all probably descendants of this one. So this tree will live on, even though its life is coming to an end. If you get out in Riverwood, look for the stories. There are lots of stories, and we'll hopefully tell you a few more of them as we go along.